Good morning, everyone. At the outset, we would like to thank the scientific chair, Dr. Manoria Sir, and the chairperson, Dr. Mahapatra, for giving us an opportunity to chair a session in this National Symposium on Cardiodiabetic Conclave 2021 of our ever teacher and mentor, Dr. Manoria Sir. He is an excellent orator and needs no introduction to the August audience. He is a director mm -hmm. and uh, director Manoria Heart and Critical Care Hospital, Bhopal. He is a former professor and head department of cardiology, Gandhi Medical College, Bhopal. He has been the past national president of CSI, API, and ICC. He is a past chairman of Hypertension Council, Asian Pacific Society of Cardiology, and past vice president, Sark Cardiac Society. He has had many prestigious awards to his credit, and he has organized several national and international conferences over the last 40 years, including first World Congress on Cardiometabolic Medicine 2019 in Mumbai. He has several publications to his credit and has delivered more than 500 lectures and various conferences. So for the next 20 minutes, he would be speaking on diabetes care, dawn of a new era. Dr. Manoria, sir, please. Uh, good morning, everybody. So for the next 12 minutes, I'll be talking on this interesting topic, diabetes care, dawn of a new era. During the last couple of years, there has been a sea change in diabetes care, both in terms of an end's understanding and in the availability of a panoply of newer therapeutic options. The first thing I'm going to touch is the advances in therapeutics. All of us know the mere presence of diabetes cut short the lifespan by six years. And if an AMI or stroke gets superimposed, the lifespan is cut short by 12 years. But now we have new anti-diabetic medications like TLP-1 receptor agonists, which target ACVD, and SGLT2 inhibitors target CKD and heart failure. And therefore, if these agents are used for a longer time in large number of patients, this figure of minus 12 can be slashed down to a much lower level. Now, when we look at this scenario of anti-diabetic medication during the last uh, century from 1920 to 2020, if we look at the issue whether any conventional anti-diabetic medication improves CV outcomes, the answer is a big no. They only provide glycemic control. And therefore, from 1920 to 2004, we were amidst an era of glycemic control and glycemic control for diabetes care. And don't forget if your glycemic control is modulated by new anti-diabetic medication, you can die of a myocardial infarction with an excellent HbA1c of 6.5 as one of our patients. Then after the Rosicrucian story, we have the era of glycemic safety. And currently we are amidst an era of cardiorenal risk reduction with two new anti-diabetic medications, SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP-1 receptor agonists. And both these molecules are building pillars for treatment of diabetes as we have pillars for heart failure. Both these molecules, the SGLT2 inhibitors, they target the cardiorenal continuum. The GLP-1 receptor agonist, which targets ACVD. SGLT inhibitors are being increasingly utilized because they are available as oral medications and DAPA has become off patent. Whereas GLP-1 receptor agonists are not widely used because they are costly and available as injectable therapy, which precludes their widespread use. But now, for the first time in the world, we have polypeptide available in a pill and oral semaglutide, which is already launched in five countries across the world, will be shortly available in India, and we are awaiting that day to rejoice the launch of this unique innovation. SGLT2 inhibitors, SGLT2 inhibitors have become panacea for heart failure. They improve the outcome of HEF-REF, and they also improve the outcome of HEF-PEP, as per the Emperor Prasad presented the uh, day before yesterday. SGLT2 inhibitors have completed the entire circle of cardiovascular continuum, we have trials with primary prevention. We have trials with secondary prevention. We have the trials with uh, HEP-REP and HEP-PEP. And no single molecule in the world has ever improved the outcome of HEP-REP and HEP-PEP. In fact, SGLT2 inhibitors are the first evidence-based target for treatment of HEP-PEP. And they also improve renal outcome, as we'll see. 
So SDLT2 inhibitors not only target the whole CV continuum, they also target the cardiorenal continuum. They improve, they decrease hospitalization for HF as shown by several trials. And this benefit is seen whether you have ACVD or no ACV. And prevention of hospitalization of heart failure is a great event because every hospitalization, every re-hospitalization takes the patient closer to death. This is the DAPA HF trial. All of us are familiar with this. This was prematurely terminated, included diabetics as well as non diabetics. And you can see the primary endpoint cardiovascular death, hospitalization for HF, and urgent HF is 26% reduction, worsening heart failure 30% reduction, cardiovascular death 18%, and all cause mortality 17%. The benefit starts early. And the first big message was diabetics as well as non-diabetics both show equal benefit. The second big message was shown benefit on top of RD. And the third big message, it is poised to postpone device therapy in heart failure. More benefit in NYJ class two heart failure, so they should be initiated early. Prior hospitalization, more benefit, non-ischemic, more benefit, and they are very safe molecules. 2020, we have the emperor a reduced trial, which has shown similar benefit, except some minor differences at the all cause mortality and uh, cardiovascular death, which was significantly uh, decreased with the DAPA HF, was not decreased with empagliflozin. And this is the landmark trial, which was presented in ESC recently, Emperor Preserve trial. And this is the first trial, which has shown positive result in HEPA, a 21% reduction in the composite primary endpoint of cardiovascular death, hospitalization for heart failure which is driven mainly by decreased hospitalization for heart failure. And there's no change in the cardiovascular death or no change in the all cause mortality. There was a slowing of the decline in EGFR, but decline in EGFR, but somehow the benefits were not seen in the clinical endpoints. Maybe that the duration of the trial is a little smaller. All benefited subgroups, males and females also benefit unlike the Paragon trial, and all ranges of ejection fraction less than 50, 50 to 60, and greater than 60 also benefited. And this is the post hoc analysis of only hospitalization for heart failure. And you can see benefit is seen across the range up to 65. When we are treating heart failure, you should never forget that both heart failure and CKD should be treated in conjunction because there's a close interconnect between heart failure and CKD. The cardiorenal continuum should be targeted as a whole and never forget targeting kidney disease triggers benefit for the heart failure. And this has been the missing link for many years, which we have now recognized. CKD is classified on the basis of EGFR and the uh, albuminuria. And this shows an overview of all the trials in 2023-24. The normal EGFR is 0.9 ml. Diabetic CKD, the EGFR drops to 10 ml, and most of them go for dialysis and transplant prior to the RAS blockers, but RAS blocker came as a first revolution and slowed down the declining GFR from 10 to 4.59, which was indeed a great uh, event. The second revolution came with SGLT2 inhibitor, which further slowed down the declining GFR from 4.9 to 1.85. And the third revolution is now with the non-steroidal MRA, Veneranon, the Fidelio DKD and the Figario DKD has been positive. And this, unlike the two other agents, also target inflammation and fibrosis. And they can slow down the trajectory of CKD postponed dialysis by 15 years or so. We have also the dual SGLT inhibitor, and this has shown fascinating results. As you can see, this is a pooled analysis of the solo standard score trial. You can see cardiovascular death, HHF, and urgent HF visit decreased significantly by about uh, 28%. Half rep. Benefit is again there, have PEP, benefit is again there. And a new finding emerged from the score trial that cardiovascular death, non-fatal MI, non-fatal stroke, which were not decreased with SGLT2 inhibitors, but decreased with sotaglopozin. And GLP-1 RA are the molecules which target ACVD. Four trials, leader, sustain, harmony, and rewind have shown positive results. Leader decreased the maze by 13%, cardiovascular death by about uh, 22% uh, and all cause mortality by 15%. Sustaining the reduction was 26% in maize, predominantly driven by decrease in the stroke. And the harmony trial, 22% reduction in the uh, maize, 25% uh, reduction in MI, and rewind 12% reduction as included 
the primary prevention of group and DLP1 receptor agonists has been approved across the globe by all guidelines. Besides providing ACBD protection, they decrease the HbA1c by 1 to 1.5, weight by 3 to 5 kgs, and they have a panoply of anti atherosclerotic effects which benefits ACBD events. There are two barriers to GLP-1. It's a costly drug and injectable, but the criticism of cost may not be appropriate always because 80% of the cost is involved in treatment of complication, and these agents are used early in life. You may be able to prevent uh, ACVD, and uh, the cost benefit may be on the favorable side. Injectable therapy is another limitation, but now with availability of oral semaglutide in future, this may be circumvented. Because GLP-1 RA targets ACVD and uh, SGLT2 targets uh, heart failure and CKD. A combination would be a comprehensive treatment for patients of diabetes with multiple comorbidities, but when injectable GLP is available, this may not be easily possible, but when oral semaglutide is available, it will be easy to use both these molecules in combination. Twin cancer therapy is also being evaluated, and it is a combination of GIP and GLP-1, and the surplus cardiovascular outcome trial is in progress. We have also in an era of a disease-modifying approach for treatment of hyperglycemia, you can see we have the GLP-1 receptor agonist, which targets six of the eight components of the ominous octet. SGLT2 targets renal defect, and PIAS targets insulin resistance at the level of the adipose. Glycemic variability is also coming in vogue. When we were a student, it was that glycemic tried, as you can see on the slide, but has it now shifted to the hexad with hypoglycemia, nocturnal hypoglycemia, and glyco, uh, glycemic variability also included. But one another thing should also be included, I personally feel, is the recovery from hypoglycemia is also an important visit. If you are looking at glycemic variability, uh, you can uh, look at the peaks and troughs. And with similar HbA1c hemoglobin, you can have different troughs and peaks. So the glycemic variability should be targeted. And this is the time in range, 70% of time, your uh, glucose control should be in the range of 70 to 180. These are the level one and two. Uh, peaks and these are the two troughs for hypoglycemia. Hypoglycemia should be minimized. If your TIR is deranged by 10%, there's increase in the microvascular complications and time for change has come and most of the professional mm -hmm. bodies are now- One minute left. Is important. As a cardiologist, hypoglycemia is very important. And if there's increased glycemic variability and decrease in TIR, hypoglycemia detrimentally affects cardiovascular outcome. If you have glycemic variability, the peaks, and the traps are taken care of by basal insulin. The second generation provides greater benefit than the first. Glucagon is also emerging and is being evaluated for treatment of diabetes because glucagon antagonists are being evaluated for treatment and glucagon antagonists are being evaluated for treatment of obesity because it decreases appetite and increases energy expenditure. These are the antagonists which are being evaluated for diabetes and these are the agonists which are being evaluated for uh, the treatment of uh, obesity. Hypoglycemia is detrimental. It uh, mediates through several pathways. Interestingly, newer drugs, SGLT2 and GLP-1 receptor agonists, they produce minimal or no hypoglycemia. And they can be used in conjunction with the older drugs like metformin, fibrozone, DP4, so that hypoglycemia can be minimized. Lastly, hereditary, all of us know, plays an important role in development of diabetes. Please remember your genetics load the gun, your lifestyle pulls the trigger. So even if you have a family history of diabetes, adopt healthy lifestyle to postpone diabetes. And in summary, gone are the days when diabetes was treated merely by glycemic control. We are now powered to improve heart failure, CKD, and ACVD outcomes of diabetes by SGLT2 inhibitors and DLP1 receptor agonists. Polypeptide is now available as a pill for the first time in the world as oral semaglutide. Glycemic control is now being better monitored and understood by CDM and TIR, and twin catheter therapy and glycoglucagon antagonists are being evaluated for future therapies, and hypoglycemia should be minimal or absent, and this is indeed a feature of new anti-diabetic medication. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, sir. Nice. Uh... Uh, lecture. Uh, can I ask some questions, sir? Yes. Uh, can SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP-RA used together? 
I already told you because diabetics in the long run commonly have heart failure, they have CKD and they have GLP-1 RS. So there is a plea to use both these agents once patient has all these comorbidities. When GLP-1 is available as injected therapy, it was a difficult uh, proposal because many patients don't uh, agree for an injectable therapy. But when oral semaglutide becomes available, they can be used together with oral SGLT2 inhibitors. Uh, okay. Sir, uh, let, can I ask? Uh, yes. My question, sir, is uh, uh, in the trial presented yesterday, which you have elaborated, Emperor Preserved, will it be a class effect? So far as heart failure is concerned, this is a signature effect. We have seen it in heart failure with use ejection fraction. We are awaiting the result of the delivered trial. With DAPA, if the delivered trial also comes out to be positive, it will be a signature effect both in half rep as well as in half pep. But half rep, this is a signature effect across all SBLT2 inhibitors. Thank you, sir. Sir, one more question. Yeah. Uh, what is the difference between the steroidal MRS and non steroidal MRS? The non the steroidal MRAs are uh, spironolactone and aplinaron, and they produce benefit in heart failure. We have landmark trials like the rails, we have other FSS and MPSS, and they have detrimental effect on the kidneys. Whereas uh, the non steroidal MRAs, the aplinaron, they have beneficial effect on the kidneys. Potassium elevation is very mild. And they are not used in the treatment of refractory hypertension like the spinal lepton, which is used as the core drug in uh, hypertension. And as I alluded to you, DKD trial was positive with uh, phenadron. So that is the basic difference between both these. Thank you, Thank you sir. Uh, I would like to ask one question, sir. Uh, when uh, oral semiglutide would be available in India, what would be the dose uh, in diabetic patients? And my second question is, why is it not uh, degraded in stomach like other polypeptides? See, if you use oral semaglutide, uh, it will be degraded in the stomach because of low pH, because of proteolytic enzyme. But in oral semaglutide, it is co-formulated with snack, which increases the local pH, so avoid degradation by proteolytic enzymes. It increases solubility, so there's more penetration into the blood and also increase the bioavailability of the drug. So these are the reasons why it is not degraded. Regarding your second questions, uh, the dose, we usually start uh, with a lower dose to avoid uh, the side effects. So three milligram once daily for one month, then we can increase it to seven milligram once daily for the next month. And then the optimum dose of 14 milligram daily for the next month. So yeah. the titration is achieved usually in three months. We see Dr. Ekedas here. As you rightly said, uh, in the clinical trials, uh, most of the people, get, uh, most of the effects we get at the 7 milligram, 14 yes. milligram we don't extend, uh, ex uh, don't, don't go to 7 milligram. And sometimes if the side effects are more, you rightly said one month, we can wait up to two to three months also. But three to seven milligram, we get all the thing. Now, I just want to ask you one thing that, uh, you know, the cardio, renal and the metabolic benefits of the SG, SG LT2 has been, you are beautifully, I, I really congratulate you for the wonderful review. Yesterday evening, we had a presentation by Chantal Matthew and by David Sen in one of the meetings with uh, Bridge Mucker organized called on obesity. And the exact data on the GLP-1, SGLT-2, what Alok asked was presented. And, and, and it was found that the results are of a far reaching consequence. I just wanted to know from you one important issue that uh, the benefits in the non-diabetic population also, uh, PC, has been very well documented. So have you started using SGLT2 inhibitors, which are available plenty in the market, for the non-diabetic population with the cardiac problems? We have been using for quite some time since the results are fascinating, both in diabetic and non-diabetic patients. I have a plea to the diabetologist that GLP-1 offers ACVD benefits, which is not mediated through the glycemic benefits, just as SGLT2 is not mediated through glycemic. So you should style trials of GLP-1 RA also in non-diabetic patients, because Absolutely. the benefits are not related to glycemic pathways. Absolutely. Dedicated, dedicated non-diabetic trials. Yeah. Thank you. Thank or you. Or maybe a combination. Thank you, Professor.